some scripture with you. Uh, if this is not familiar scripture, it should be. If this is not familiar scripture, it should be. My guess is you probably have heard somebody else say this, heard another pastor talk about this. My guess is you probably heard grandmama talk about this, but, the, but if you're not reading this scripture and you're not reading it at least once a month, this is not a part of your life, your DNA. This is a promise of God. This is what God has promised to his chosen people. If you don't know the promise, then you won't be able to fulfill the promise. If you can't see the promise, you can't, you can't fulfill. You won't, it won't be fulfilled in your life. You, you, if you can't see it, you can't be it. And so you just need to take some time, just like maintenance. You just need to go in every once in a while, and you need to read these promises of God, and then you need to check them against your life. And if that's something out of order, then you need to look back to God, look back to yourself. Amen? Amen. So I'm going to read these very familiar verses uh, in Deuteronomy chapter 28. I'm going to start at verse 9, and I think I'm going to go to 14. And look what he's talking about in the Lord now. He says, the Lord will establish you as a holy people. To himself. Isn't that amazing? Somebody say, I'm holy. No. Somebody say, regardless of what I've done in my past, I'm holy. Regardless of what I do today, I'm holy. Regardless of what I do tomorrow, I am holy. Regardless of what I do tomorrow, I am holy. Because Jesus' blood justifies me. Because Jesus' blood justifies me. Amen. He says, the, I should just get benediction right there, right? <laughs> That's a benediction moment right there. The Lord will establish you at you. Point, point to yourself, you. You, you, you as a holy people to himself. You've been told too many bad, I hear the Spirit of the Lord saying, too many people heard too many bad things about yourself. People trying to control you. People trying to manipulate you. They saw value in you is why they said the things that they said because they wanted to own the value in you. The Spirit of the Lord is speaking to me right now to somebody. The reason why, the reason why they said the things that they said to you was because they saw the value in you. They saw you as the holy person. They saw the good on the inside of you. And what they wanted to do is they wanted to control that good that was on the inside of you. They didn't know what to do with it. They didn't know what to do with you. And so they began to say ugly things and nasty things. And they began to make you think about yourself in a way that God does not think about you. You are holy people to himself. Just as he has sworn to you, if you keep the commandments of the Lord your God and walk in his ways, then all peoples of the earth shall see that you are called by the name of the Lord and they shall be afraid of you. Then he says, and, and the Lord will grant you plenty of goods. God's going to be with you. Now, God, get this now. He says, that's this obedience part. But, but out of this obedience comes these blessings. He didn't say out of disobedience you're going to be saved. He talked about being a chosen people before he said anything about, about uh, uh, being uh, blessed, right? He is already, you already chosen. Don't, don't worry about that. See, sometimes we get caught up in whether or not we're going to heaven or not. I'm talking about on earth. I'm talking about what you're going to experience. Oh, that's what this is about. You already chosen. Yeah. Now he says, before he even talks about keeping a commandment or doing, following a rule or being in, a, in the way of God, he already says you chose him before that. And now he begins to talk about what happens when your obedience is in order. He says, and the Lord will grant you plenty of goods in the fruit of your body. You want, you, he'll, he'll give you health. He'll, he'll bring seed out of you. In, in, in the increase of your livestock, he will multiply your, your, your bank account. He'll multiply things in your, in your uh, finances and in the produce of your ground, in the land of, of, of which the Lord swore to your fathers to give you. The Lord will open to you his good treasure. He'll give you any good thing. He'll give you anything that you need to get through any situation in your life. The heavens to give the rain to your land in its season. The rain is a good thing, but when you get too much rain, it's not good. He says, I'll give it to you the way you need it in order to be prosperous and to bless all the work of your hand. Anything you put your hand to, the Spirit of the Lord says, I'll bless it. Amen. He says, you shall be 
lender to many nations, but you shall not have to borrow from anybody. He says, you're going to be a lender and not a borrower. He says, and the Lord will make you the head and not the tail. You shall be above only and not beneath. Above only. Somebody say above only. Above only. And not beneath. Not beneath. He says, if you heed the commandments of the Lord your God. Again, he's saying there's some obedience that needs to take place. You need to do some things in order. You need to follow some wisdom that comes from God in order for these things to happen. He says, if you, if you heed the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you today, and are careful to observe them, so you shall not turn aside from any of the words which I, com which I command you this day to the right or to the left to go after other gods put a pen in that to go after other gods to serve them Father God we come to you now in the name of your son Yeshua the Christ God we come praying and believing in the promises of God we believe in the promises that you've made us the lender and not the borrower we believe in the promise that you've made us above and not beneath we believe in the promise that you've made us the head and not the tail we believe in every promise that you've written in your word. We believe that we are the chosen people. We believe that through our faith in Christ that we have become in that we have received an inheritance, that we become heirs of the kingdom of God. And we're believing that today with all of our heart. Now what we want, God, all we want is we want to understand what it means to have an inheritance. God, sometimes we don't feel rich. Sometimes we don't feel rich in, in spirit. Sometimes we don't feel rich uh, in the physical. Sometimes we don't feel uh, rich in our minds, God. There's, there's something separating us from feeling like we have enough. There's something separating us from believing that you are God of plenty and that you want to bless us with grace and the treasures in heaven. And so, God, I just pray that you begin to remove any confirmation. Allow us to see our inheritance like never before. Allow us to see it so we can be it. And we pray these things in the name of your son, Yeshua the Christ. Amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. I want to talk to you today from the topic of of seeing your inheritance, seeing your inheritance. We've been going through um, Ephesians 1. We've been looking at Ephesians 1. And we've been going through those things that God, uh, through Paul, begins to tell us are important things for us to be able to see. Uh, and we get to this place in, inside of, of, of the Word of God, and we begin to look at this thing. God begins, Paul begins to talk about this thing called an inheritance. And, you know, it, it began to make me think about an article that I saw uh, in December of 2019, end of the year, As God began to talk to me about vision. He began to show me a few things. Uh, and in this article that I was reading, it was talking about the number of people who played the lottery. I had one to go out and buy this one. Does, Deacon Mobley does not play the lottery, at least to my knowledge. Uh, although he knew how to sign this and everything. I'm not sure how he learned how to do all that. But, but, uh, but I had Deacon... I had Dick, oh, Sister White is the one who, t okay. I had um, Dick and Mobley to go out and get me one of these lottery tickets. And I, you know, it's a shame. I could have probably just went in and got my own lottery ticket. But sure enough, if I would have been in there, a whole family of uplift people would have been, been there as well. And everybody would have been looking at Pastor, you know, play the lottery. And I'm not saying whether playing the lottery is right or wrong. I'm, that's, not, that's not my goal today is to talk about playing the lottery. What I want to talk to you about is, this article began to talk about the number of people who do not claim lottery ticket. It, 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 it's amazing. Like, they go out and they play the lottery. They go to the gas station or grocery store or whatever. They pretty much do it anywhere now, pretty much. They go to the place where the lottery is. They go up to the desk. They, they go through the process of understanding what numbers they believe are lucky, lucky numbers, right? They give all these, I mean, it's one, two, three, four, five, six numbers. And so they probably, birth, birth month, the actual day, uh, mama birth month. You know, they go through this process, all that work that goes into getting these numbers together. They actually go into a place, drive to a place. They go inside and they buy the lottery ticket. They take it. More more than likely, they probably uh, do what Deacon Mobley did, sign the back of it and, you know, write the information on it. And then they just throw it away, put it up somewhere. 
Don't pay attention to it. Don't follow it. Don't look at the, 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 the television on whatever night they show. What night do they show this? Whatever night they show the, uh, the lottery winnings. They, they don't go and look at it. They, they're not connected because once these lotteries are won, they're on the news all the time. And every week that goes by and a person doesn't claim the ticket, they're talking about, got this lottery drawing. Nobody's claimed the ticket. And it is an amazing amount. The last full year that they showed in this article, there was $3 billion Somebody say billion. billion. Billion dollars of unclaimed lottery tickets. Listen to me now. People, people prayed for the lottery. They prayed for it. Even as they were in there getting the lottery ticket, they probably were talking to God. You know, God, let this be. I need, you know how bad I need this. Please, God, I need you to move on my behalf. I need you to help me out. I need you to get me through this. Just let me win this lottery. And, and they don't claim it. Last year, the end of last year, December, a 15, $14.9 million lottery ticket went unclaimed. What could $14.9 million not do in your life, do in the life of all the people you know? It would change generationally, change your entire family. $14.9 million managed in the right way. There would not be a person that comes in your lineage that wouldn't be taken care of. $14.9 million lottery ticket. Somebody went in, they figured this out, or either they did a, a, a fast pick or whatever it's called. They did something. They got lucky. They found this lottery, and, and for whatever reason, they didn't turn the ticket in. They didn't go back up and claim the ticket. They did not get the lottery. And so what happens is they, they just live without taking the full advantage. They're winners. They've won the lottery. They'll go down in history as somebody who won the lottery. You cannot change the fact that they won the lottery, but they don't, they've not cashed in on the benefits. And as I begin to think about grace, as I begin to think about salvation, you know, we've won the lottery. We, when God has chosen us, when he's opened up his, 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 his heavens to us, when he's allowed his son to come back and die for us, he basically, we basically won the lottery. We were actually chosen. But you know what? There'll be some of us who will win that lottery and go to heaven. You're going to go to heaven, but live in hell on earth. You go to heaven, you'll get all the, the glorious inheritance and every day of your life, you'll be robbing Peter to pay Paul. Every day of your life, you'll be wondering when, pay, how far, every, payday is the same amount of days it was yesterday from the day. If you know exactly when the payday coming. And, and, and that's no way for us to be living. God never intended. There's nothing about being the head and not the tail. There's nothing about being above and not beneath. There's nothing about being the lender and not the borrower that looks like living from paycheck to paycheck. It's none of that exists in, in what God has called us to be. Matter of fact, every single person in here has been called to this inheritance. This, you know, you've been, called, you've been called to be blessed. You've been called to be rich. And rich by definition in the Bible is not what you consider to be rich in, in your standard. Rich by definition in the Bible is that you have more than what you need. That's it. I know we have standards for rich. I know we, we, we believe that a certain person has to drive a certain thing to be rich or have a certain thing. But this is the promise from God is that he will supply everything that you need. And this is what happens when, when we get this, when we get this grace, when we get this salvation into our life, we get just like these people with these tickets. We get so distracted by so many other things and looking at so much other stuff that we begin to get further and further and further and further away from the promise that God has for us. And what we've got to do in this season, that's what this series is about. This series is about giving you 2020 vision. You need to understand what it needs to be, what it means to be rich. You need to understand what it means to live rich. You need to understand what it means to be an heir to the inheritance. And today, what I want to focus on today is, is seeing your inheritance. You need to get to this place where you see your inheritance. And, and, and this is what Paul is praying in Ephesians 1. Uh, chapter 17, I mean, chapter, Ephesians 1, verses 17 and 18. And you have to begin to really, really pay attention to this. As we've been reading through this, and I want you guys to get this in your spirit, he says, I keep asking that the God of our Lord Yeshua Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation. In other words, I'm praying, and this is what you need to be praying. We are praying that God will give us vision. 
That he'll allow us to be able to understand everything that we need to understand. And specifically, Paul begins to say, you need this vision in these few areas. He says the first area was that we will understand him better. And we've, we talked about that a few weeks ago. And then he goes a little bit further and he says, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you. We talked about that a few weeks ago. Keisha talked about it again last week. That you would begin to understand the difference between his purpose and your calling and then he goes a little bit further he says not only do I want you to understand come back he says not only do I want you to understand the hope to which I've called you but, but, but look at this he says that you need to be able to see the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people he said that you need to be able to get to this place where you can see what God can do for you, where you can understand God and trust God as the source of all things, as the owner, they said in the Old Testament, as a God with cattle on a thousand hills, like anything that you need. Got to get this, whether it's health, whether it's in your spirit, whether it's in your finances, anything that you need, God's got it. You need to understand that and you need to believe God's got it. So a lot of the people who, who don't turn this in, they don't really believe, they buy the ticket, don't even believe in it. Don't even believe they have an opportunity to make it. Don't even believe that they could ever be, be chosen to win this thing. So they don't even pay attention to it. It's in a landfill somewhere. Three billion dollars of people who don't claim this, most of them can't even find it because when they bought it, they didn't even believe it. He says that we need to get to this place where we can see clearly what it is that God has promised us and we can see clearly how, listen, we cannot allow, and this is the issue, we're allowing things to stand in the way of our inheritance. We, we allow, so in order for you to get this, this money right here, you've got to be able to sign, you've got to sign this thing and you've got to go cash it in, you've got to take it in. And in order for us to get our inheritance from God, there's some obedience. Remember, we just talked about this in Deuteronomy. There's an obedience thing that leads to a lot of the blessings and when those obedient things are not happening it's blocking blessings it's standing in the way you don't have to even second guess why you're not seeing this inheritance in your life it's you it's me it's us in certain areas of our life it's us we're doing things that are contrary to God's word and that is the reason why we're not seeing the riches that we should be seeing in our life and I'm not going to stand up here today and I'm not going to tell you that, that you, just, you just name it and you just claim it and God's going to give it to you and God's going to do it. That's not what I'm telling you. What I'm telling you is when you gave your hand to Christ and you became a believer and you believed in him, you were guaranteed the, uh, 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 riches in heaven for sure. You, you go into heaven. That, that's what you were absolutely guaranteed. But obedience on this side of heaven yeah. is going to result in how you live on this side of heaven. That the things that you do on this side of heaven are going to impact you. It's not going to stop. As long as you believe, as long as you believe that Christ died for you, as long as you believe that, that he is your savior, that he rose for you, you go into heaven. And listen, streets of gold, mansions, and all that stuff. But I want, I want, I want some of this on this side. I don't want to live. I don't want my body to be sick all the time. I don't, want to, I don't want to live in this place where my mind is always confused and all over the place. And I, I don't know whether I'm coming or whether I'm going. I don't want to live in this place of loneliness. God, he said, you, you said you'll supply my every need. I don't want to be lonely. I don't want to be in this place where I'm hurting all the time. I don't want to be in this place where I'm, I'm in pain all the time. I don't want to be in this place where I'm worried all the time. I don't want to be in this place where I'm confused all the time. I don't want to be in this place where I owe everybody. Now, I feel like I can't have none of what I earn for myself because everything I got it seems like it's going out to somebody else and I see other people all around me prospering and, and I feel like God I feel like I'm not prospering like, like you got to get to this place where you get sick and tired of not following the process all the way through for every area of your life you got to get to this place where you get sick and tired of not cashing in the blessings of God for your life you got to get to this place where you get sick and tired of lack and not having it and being laid up and can't move and crying all the time and upset all the time and when you get to that place you sign the back of this thing and you begin to cash this thing you begin to cash it and you begin to see that inheritance and it, it began to show up in your life but it's all about obedience 
And, and what you have to be able to see, the first thing that you have to be able to see, you have to be able to see that, that the source of your inheritance. You have to be able to see it by see. You have to be able to believe that you serve a God that can do all things. And not only can he do all things, but for you, his chosen people, he wants it. This is the issue. So some of us get in that condemnation stuff. We start to say, you know, this is for past this and past that, and I don't deserve this, and I know why I'm being punished for this, and I know why God is doing this to me, and it, that's, that, that couldn't be further from the truth. Matter of fact, Paul says there is absolutely no condemnation in us, in us that are in Christ and those that believe in Christ. And what's really happening is because we don't believe, because we're not believing God for what we need, because we're trying to do things out of our own strength, we end up making a lot of mistakes, and we end up having to pay for those mistakes. Because we want to be rich, we want to look rich, we think if we go and get a few things and we charge a few things and we look like we got it together and we look like we're rich, that we are all, you know, we're going to fake it till we make it. I think that's the expression that we use. And that can be nothing worse in the spiritual realm, faking it till you make it. No, 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 you're just there. You don't have to fake anything. Look, look, what, look what he says. You need to understand. This is what Paul is saying to the, to, the, to the Philippian church. He says, you need to understand. You need to be able to see the fact that my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. I don't care what you need, Paul says. I know somebody that can fulfill what you need. I do not care what you're going through. He didn't put in, he said, all your needs. He didn't put it, he didn't say all the needs you have to pay off your bills. Or all the needs you have. No, no, no. All means all. Matter of fact, I look this word up in the Greek every time. I just have to look at it in the Greek for myself. This word all means everything. You have a God and you have to believe and you have to understand the source. The source of your supply is not your job. They'll lay you off. Right when you need them the most, they'll can you. They'll put you right out there on the street. They'll cut you back. They'll begin to treat. If they don't lay you off, they'll treat you so bad that you'll leave. That's, don't, do not put your trust inside of your job. Do not put your trust in money. Money is as funny as it can get. You can do nothing and get a whole lot of it, and you can do everything in the world and not get paid a dime for it. Do not put your trust in it. He said, I am the person that can supply your every need. He's, what Paul says is that he knew this. He says, I serve a God who can supply everything that you need. What are you needing today? God can supply. That's what Paul says. What Pastor Mean says, whatever you are needing today, there's only one person that can supply. That person that told you, oh, boo, I love you. I want, you know, I'm going to be with you. I'm going to, no, 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 no. That, 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 don't, don't you trust in that. No telling what you have to give up to get that. See, God is not asking you to do anything but believe, but you may have to give up a certain part of you that you don't want to give up in order to get that promise. You better put everything that you have, all your trust, inside of a God who can and shall supply everything you need. You need, to, you need to be able to see in this season. You need to be able to see the source, but you also need to be able to see, you need to see yourself as rich. You know, the biggest problem with, with this lottery thing is that a lot of people, they just, listen, they just don't see, they just don't believe that they, that they can win. They just don't believe that they can do it. They just don't believe it. They actually are somewhere thinking about it, and they're saying, even when they buy this ticket, they don't see themselves as a winner. They don't see it possible. They don't believe it's possible. They, you know, and, and it could be a lot of things for that, a lot of statistics that might. But why would you buy something? Why would you sign up for something that you don't believe in? You got to get to this place where you understand what Paul tells the Corinthian church. For you know that, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that, that though he was rich, he had it all. He was in heaven. He had everything. I mean, he had it all. Although he was rich, yet for your sakes, he became poor, that you through his poverty might become rich. Everybody in this room, you're rich if you believe in Christ, is what, what Paul is saying. You don't have to try and go out and spend money to try to impress yourself or impress somebody else. You don't have to wear a certain thing. You don't have to drink a certain thing. You don't have to drive a certain thing. You are already rich before you get anything. The only thing that you had to get was Christ. And once you got Christ inside of your life, you became rich. This is what you need to be able to see. You need to be able to see that, 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 that you're the head. You need to stop putting yourself down. You need to stop saying ugly and nasty things. You need to stop, this, this, check this out now. You need to stop putting other people above you. Don't put pastor above you. Don't put first lady above you. We're not above you. We're walking through this journey with you. We're not better than you. 
We're just here to serve. We're just serving right on. That's the wonderful thing about serving. You don't have to have a PhD. You don't have to have a fancy job. You don't have to wear a certain kind of shoes. The only thing that you have to do to, to serve, to be a part of this Christian walk, is to believe in Christ. That's it. Look what, look what Peter says. He says, all of you, be, be, be submissive to one another. And be clothed with humility. And, and for God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. He says, therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you. That he may put you to the top. That he may exalt you in due time. And, and you got to get this in your spirit because it's not about bossing people around. That's not what being on top is about. That's not what being the head is about. I know we stay in a society and they make you seem like, they make it seem like in order for you to be on top, you got to be a take charge person. You got to be able to tell people what to do. And you got to be able to keep people in their place. But nothing could be farther from the truth. Matter of fact, when you sit down and you interview CEOs and the people who serve the CEOs, what you find out nine times out of ten is that they are some of the most humble People with humility. That's why I love that show, uh, Undercover Boss. When they go back, these people of humility that are three or four levels away from what's being done down here. And they go back in with, with that fake uh, wig on and that mustache and all, you know. And they go back in and they work beside the people. And they're blown away that the environment that the people are working in lacks humility. That's what happens. Every one of these shows. That these are CEOs and the way they made it to the top of their company was through a spirit of humility putting other people first and all of a sudden they're getting uh, an experience that shows that that's not what the company is about below them and then they go through and they change the entire company so that everybody treats everybody right so that everybody is submissive to one another and treats everybody right so that everybody is clothed with humility so that everybody is resisting and, and this is what you got to understand if you're trying to do it the other way that is what's blocking your blessing if you're trying to make yourself the head, instead of waiting for God to exalt you, he says, look right here, he says, God resists the proud. If you're walking around talking about who you are and what you have and how much experience you got and how powerful you are and how early you got there, you know all that stuff, that, that humble brag stuff. If you're walking around humble bragging all the time, talking about how good you are and all this wonderful stuff, what he's saying is God, is he opposes that. God's not impressed by that. And listen, most people are not impressed by it either. I'm just going to tell you what they want to tell you. Shut up! <laughs> That's what they want to say to you when you're bragging and you're talking about how great and wonderful you are. You need to understand that God opposes the proud and most people do also. And what God wants us to do, if you want to get to this place of inheritance, you've got to get to this place where you humble yourself. Where you allow for yourself to have humility. That's what Jesus did. You humble yourself. You sacrifice for others. You put others ahead of you. And what God does in that, in that situation, he raises you up. He exalts you. Not only do you have to see yourself as the head, but you need to be able to see yourself as above. You need to be able to see yourself as a chosen people. Stop looking down on yourself. You need to be able to see yourself as a royal priesthood. You need to be, be able to see yourself as a holy. You are holy. You are royal. You are chosen. This is what you need to do. You need to get to this place where you're worshiping because God has chosen you. He says that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. And here's the issue. This is what's blocking you. You need to understand, first of all, that you are chosen, that you are holy, that you are royal, that you are God's special possession. And once you understand that, you need to praise him. If you're not praising God, first of all, if you don't believe this about you, you're not going to get the inheritance. You're going to continue to do stuff that's going to sabotage you. That's what people who do when they don't believe these things about themselves. They get in relationships that they shouldn't get in. They hang around people that they shouldn't hang around. They make mistakes. They make decisions that they shouldn't make. And if you think about the biggest mistakes that you've made, you can tie them back to how you felt about yourself. And, and what he's saying is, you've got to see yourself as, a cho as above. You've got to see yourself as a person that God c continues to see as a special possession. And then you've got to get to the place where because you know that about yourself, as sorry as you have been and mistakes that you've made, that you begin to praise God for not counting your faults against you. For not holding that against you, you praise because you know the things that disqualify this from you and you know the blood of Christ qualifies you for this and because you know you've been disqualified but qualified by Christ, you praise him. 
Not, not only do you have to see yourself as above, but you have to see yourself as the lender. You know, that's, that's a big thing about our society. You know, that a mortgage should not be more than seven years. You understand that the Bible says that you shouldn't owe any man longer than seven years. When they first created mortgages, they were seven-year mortgages. That's why your grandma and them or whoever you went to, that's why they were in such a small house and nine kids in that small house. Because you couldn't borrow more money than you could pay back in seven years based on your income. And what's happened is they've extended that time to 30 years. I think they got a 40-year mortgage now. It's ridiculous. And this is what they want you to do. They want you to bite off more than you can chew. They want you to spend more money because the int you will never get the value back in your house when, when you add the interest that you paid on your house. When you add, uh, if, you, if you got a $200,000 house, by the time you pay that thing off over 30 years, you've been to spend $2 million almost. For a $200,000 house, you, go, you die and go away from here and your kids cash it out and get you know, $250,000, $300,000 over your entire life. It is a scam. It was never meant for you to buy. That's why you should buy your house based on what you can pay off in seven years. Humble yourself. You don't have to keep up with the Joneses. You can be rich. Now you keep up with the Joneses. Now you can't go out on vacation. You can't, you can't do what you want to do. You can't sleep at night. You count tiles trying to figure out. You borrowing from people. You trying to figure this thing out. You scheming. You working a side hustle. You doing all kinds. Of, I'm, I'm talking to somebody. You scheming. You working a side hustle. You doing all this stuff. Can't spend time with your kids. Can't rest. Because you made yourself the borrower and not the lender. And God never intended for you. Listen to me. If you're doing this, he says, look, look what he says. He says, if, if, if you're owing somebody, then, then you're allowing yourself to come out of the inheritance. He says, owe no one anything except to love one another. The only thing you're supposed to owe to another man is to love. You shouldn't be in debt to nobody. People live like this. You, you, you wouldn't believe it based on, you know, I, I, when my credit was bad, I thought everybody's credit was bad. And then when I, when I started to get my credit good and I looked at the statistics, I was in a very small group of people who had bad credit. Most of the people got good credit in the, in the United States. It, you know, I don't know who I'm talking to. I'm just telling you what I've been through. Yeah. I thought everybody had bad credit when I had bad credit. I thought I would talk about bad credit. People would laugh and I thought everybody had bad credit. But the reality of it is most people have good credit. Most people pay their bills on time. Most people buy what they can afford to pay. It's us, me, in that instance, it's, it's those of us who've tried to buy more who put themselves in a position where their credit is tarnished. Yeah. Look what he says. He says, oh, no one, anything except the love. He says, he who loves another, has fulfill you fulfilled everything. You will get the inheritance. That's a commandment. You will get the inheritance if you just can control how much debt you take out. If you just would control your finances, you could get the inheritance of God. If you could just say no, listen, if you can't afford it, say no. If, if, you, if, you, if you can't afford it, don't go. If, if you can't afford it, don't buy it. Don't wear it. If you can just make that one decision, God, you're my God. You, I, you supply my everything. I don't need these things for identity. I don't need these things to feel good about myself. I don't need these things to take me out. They don't. It never works. You got it. When you go, you got to come right back to who you were before you went. When you buy that car, when you buy that house, you got to come back, right? You, you got to move into it. You have to drive it. And until you just submit yourself to God and give yourself away to God, you're going to be you. Not only do you need to see yourself as the lender, but, but you've got to get to this place where you understand how important this whole principle is. We started this series out talking about this verse and, and, and what Jesus, this is Jesus talking about. You be, be careful. This, if we were looking at a Bible, these will be all red letters. That's how important this is what I'm about to tell you. That's why I'm telling you that. What Jesus says is the lamp of the body is the eye. If therefore your eye is good, your whole, your whole, but if, wait, wait, I'm sorry, if therefore the eye of the lamp of the body is the eye. If therefore your eye is good, your whole, but if the eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If, if therefore the light that is in you 
is darkness. How great is the darkness? And, and, and this is where he begins to talk. Now, now, he's talking about this eye. He's talking about the way you see it. He says, if the eye is bad, he says, then, then, then the whole body is going to be bad. He talks about if the eye is good, he says that the whole body is good. And then all of a sudden, it looks like he, he switches to a different topic, but he doesn't. He's talking about money the whole time. He understands that this thing that I'm telling you about, this inheritance, you having these riches, is going to be a complicated thing for you. But, but what he also understands is, is that there's a whole other side of this equation that messes everybody up. He says, no one can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. And then he, he introduces this second master. He says, you cannot serve God and mammon. Now, now, now check this out. I want you to get this now. What Jesus is saying is, there's a whole nother force out there. He calls it a second God. He says there's a whole nother force. He even calls them by name. The spirit of mammon is what he's talking about. He's mentioned all throughout the Bible in different places. This mammon was a God of, of money. And what his role was to do was to get you confused about your inheritance, to get you chasing money instead of inheriting money. You know, people who inherit something don't chase it. You just wait until it's your time and you get it. But, but what this spirit of mammon does is he makes you believe that money is everything, that money is the thing that fixes all your problems. That money is the thing that supplies every one of your needs. That no matter what's going on in your body, that money can fix it, right? But, 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 but we know that's not true. We know Steve Jobs was a billionaire. He couldn't fix his body with money. We understand that money doesn't fix anything. When your heart is broken, when you're hurting, having a little bit more money is not going to make a difference at all. When you're lonely, listen, money may buy you a few more friends, but it's not going to buy you any love. Yeah. Here's the reality of it is. This is what this thing mammon does. This, this thing that, that happens in our society, that happens all throughout the world. It gets you focused on trying to acquire money. And you think about your identity. And you think your identity is associated with money. So you got to have a certain amount. You need to make six figures. That's, what we, that's the thing that we throw out. That's six figures. We need to make six figures. When the reality of it is, if you, if you live in the United States, if you're in a household that makes $40,000, household, everybody in the house makes $40,000, you're in the 1% richest population in the world if you have running water in your house you're in the top five percent of people in the world you already rich but this thing called mammon it makes you think you got to have more and you don't have enough and you got to drive a certain thing and you've got to wear a certain thing got to have an emblem on a certain thing and when you start to looking at rich people they don't even do that stuff. when the last time you saw a rich person with a big emblem on their shirt they don't do that they, they, it's the name on the inside of a rich man's suit is his name he's not buying somebody else's suit he don't need somebody else's name he don't have to drive a certain car if somebody drives him he doesn't, he doesn't need the things that we've associated with with trying to look rich see mammon makes you want to look rich even though you don't feel rich mammon makes you feel poor even though you're already rich and Jesus begins to address this and he says it's all about vision he says when you see yourself as poor you are poor he says when you see yourself on the bottom you are on the bottom he says when you see yourself as a borrower you are going to borrow he says when you see yourself as the tail you act like a I mean you are the tail <laughs> I'm sorry yeah. He says it's all about what you see. And if you could get to this point where you saw that you were rich, you could actually be rich. If you could get to this point where you saw yourself as the head, you could actually be the head. And you wouldn't have to fight nobody or, or make them think you were the head. You just would be the head. He said if you actually saw yourself as, as a lender, you'd actually be lending. Instead of borrowing all the time. He said if you actually could see it, but this thing called mammon is making it hard for you to see it because you see money as as everything everything's about money who you hang with is about how much money they have I don't want to be around them broke folk I don't want it's all about money where you go everything the job you choose is probably about money not the thing that God is calling you to do matter of fact you're not checking with God when you choose a job you're checking with how much money they pay 
And, and what I'm here to tell you today, listen, I am so excited about this because I'm looking out in the room full of rich people. And what I'm here to tell you is that you're already rich. Money has never determined you. It's never been the thing that's got, it's, it's never done anything for you. It doesn't mean anything in your life. I know you got to have money. I know you got to pay your bills. I know you, but listen, here's the reality of it is you put too much focus on something that doesn't have the power that you think that it has. Money doesn't have the power that you think that it has. You're rich already is what I want to tell you today. N now that you're rich, who, who all accepts that they're rich? Amen. 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 So, 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 so now that you're rich, you need to act like you're rich. That's, that's what Paul begins to talk to Timothy and he begins to say these things to Timothy. And I want you to get this in your spirit. We're getting ready to get out of here. I want you to get this in your spirit. This is what you came to, this is what you came to get today. You need to understand that you're rich. And I just heard claps and applause from rich people all around this this, this sanctuary. Now, now, now you need to get to the place where you actually operate like a rich person and act like a rich person and be rich. This is what you need to do first of all. You need to become rich in hope. Look what Paul tells Timothy. This is his protege. This is him talking to us today. He says that we've got to command those who are rich. You said you're rich. Now I'm not talking to you if you're not rich. You can go back to texting. If you're not rich, don't even you, this is not for you. This, this is not for the bar. This is not for the one that's beneath. This is not for the one that's the tail. This is for those in this room who are making a declaration in your, in your, in your spirit right now that you're not going to be broke no more, that you're going to be rich, that you're going to be above, that you're going to be everything that God called you to be, that you're going to be the head and not the tail. This is what he says. He says you got to get to this place where you command those. Command yourself. That's the first person you need to command. You need to be commanding yourself who are rich because you're rich in, in this present world. Not to be, don't be arrogant. Don't be arrogant. Don't be proud. God opposes the proud. Don't be arrogant. Don't walk around here trying to show and impress people with what you have and where you live and dropping stuff about where you went to school. You know how we do it. Humble brag. You know, I went to school at such and such or, I, you know, I shop at this place. You know, when men and the girls get together, we go down and just cut that mess out. It's a waste of time. We are not impressed. And, and it, what it tells us more than anything from a biblical standpoint is you're not rich. Because when you hang around rich people, and in my work, I get a chance to hang around rich people, they, they don't do none of this stuff. He, he says, command those who are rich in this present world. The people in this room, that's who you are. You're rich in this present world. Not to be arrogant nor put their hope in wealth. Listen, he says, don't put, how silly is it that you put your hope in wealth? Something that you go that you got for a few days and it's gone. Some doesn't matter how much of it you get, you never get enough. You, you, you never have enough. A sickness can come in, anything can happen, the economy could change. People put their hope in what that's what happened. That's why we went through this last recession. We put our hope in some people who we thought were smart. They made up words like swaps and all kind of terms about real estate, and none of them made sense to anybody in the room. But we bought more of it. We bought more stock. You know, our stock price was going up. We were so rich. You know, people were talking about retiring early. We were so rich and all these things about this uh, mortgages and all this stuff and, and, and then it popped. People lost their entire retirement. People got into these Ponzi schemes because they put their hope in wealth, in wealth and so Nadar and Bernie and all these people came about and told them, I can make you wealthy. You, you, oh, you hope for wealth? Oh, then give me some of your money and I will make you wealthy. And people gave their entire, everything God had given them. 40 years of work and they took it out of something safe and secure. God had a blessing for them for the rest of their life. It was an inheritance. These people would have retired and would have lived the life God had for them. They took all that money out and they gave it to a man and that man lost all of their money. Because they put their hope. And listen to me. You got to stop putting your hope in money. Money is funny. Like I said earlier, you'll work hard and won't get paid anything. Sometimes you won't do, you get promoted and don't, don't do anything and make more money. It does not make sense. It never will make sense. He, he says you got to get to this place where you don't put your hope in money, in, in, in wealth, which is so, go back, come back, which is so uncertain. But to put their hope in God. He says instead of putting your hope in money, 
put your hope, put your trust in God who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. He gives you everything that you need, richly gives you everything that you need. You need to put your trust. First thing you need to be is you need to be, be rich in hope. You need to get to this place where you just believe. You just know. You just believe that you serve a God. He, Paul says, my God, that will supply every need that you have. It doesn't matter what you're faced with. Don't worry about anything. But in everything, go and pray to the God who will supply your every need. Trust in the God who will supply your every need. And he will give you a peace that will surpass every understanding. And not only give you a peace, he will get you through every situation in your life. Amen. He says, not only do you need to be rich in hope, but you need to get to this place where you're rich in good deeds. Look, look what he tells, tells Timothy, he continues to command. He's commanding to you today. You need to say this to yourself. He says, command them to do good. That should be a hard thing. God is blessing you. God is taking care of you. Now, you just need to do good. He says, to be rich in what? Good deeds. What does that mean? God is blessing you. God is taking care of you. You came out of this situation. You were strung out. You came out of this situation. You were divorced. You didn't know how you were going to make it. You came out of this situation. You grew up in poverty. You, you came out of this situation. You watched your grandmama suffer and, and work three and four jobs to get through a situation. You came out of this situation where you were in an abusive relationship and this person was beating you down and with their words, was beating you down with their fist in some instances. You come out of these situations. God bless you. He pulled you into this inheritance. Now you need to get out there. You need to touch every woman, every man you can that's in an abusive relationship when you meet addicts you need to be doing everything these are good deeds you need to be doing everything you can to help out somebody that's an addict if you were an addict before you need to help everybody if you've been through a marriage issue you need to be out there on the front line helping people out in their marriages regardless of the situation if you were orphaned you need to be out there helping orphans if you came from a single parent household, you need to be out there on the front line helping people. Now that God has blessed you and given you this inheritance, you need to be out there doing good deeds. You, 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 know, you know people who I, who I, who I meet who, are, who, who volunteer, who serve? You know one thing they never have? Issues. You ever talk to somebody that, that's given their life to a cause, that serve? They never, you know they talk about all the time? The cause. They talk about making a difference in folks' life. They talk about the success that the programs have. They talk about this person that they met and, and, and this person didn't have a place to go and they poured everything into this person and they did everything and then they talk about how this person is now on their own feet. That's what you talk about. When, when you talk about people who don't do this good deed thing, you know, they talk about how broke they are, how bad things are, how, how ugly the situation that they live in is. He says you got to get to this place where you become rich in good deeds and be generous and willing to share. He said in this, that's a promise for this. He said in this way they will lay up treasures for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age. You do this now, God will bless you here. You do this now, God will bless you on the other side. What, what they're saying is when you put others first, when you go out and serve, when you go out and give to people in need, God blesses you even more. You become a funnel. You become, listen, God begin when he he realizes that you're a person that will do good deeds he makes you into a funnel and he just starts to pour inside of you and, and you don't have to worry about how you're going to help these people because God just continues to pour inside of you and pour inside of you and he continues to take care of your things and he continues to make you into a funnel where you can take care of others he says in this way they will lay up treasures for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life there's no true life in being broke. There's no true life in being, uh, having too many bills and not knowing. How. There's no true life in what, with the clothes you wear this year won't be in style next year, then 20 years from now they'll be back in style. None of that means, it, none of it means anything. The true life, the true life only comes from being rich in good deeds. And then he gives this final bit of advice for those people that are rich. If you're not rich, continue to tune me out. He says that you have to be rich in wisdom. He says, Timothy, talking specifically to Timothy, put your name in that place. L Lionel, guard what has been entrusted to you. 
Don't just go out and spend on everything and everybody marketing something on the news, on this stuff, on commercials. You watching the show and, and you everything's fine with your car. You see the new model of your car. Now you got to go out and get the new model. You Everything's going fine with your phone and everything. You just about paid it off. $27 a month, pay off your iPhone. And you just about done paid it off. And there's nothing wrong with it. The face not even cracked on it. Nothing wrong with it. And then they drop a new iPhone. And now you want to go out and get the new iPhone. And now you want to go out and get the new stuff. And what he says is, this is what I want you to do. I want you to guard what you've been entrusted with, entrusted to your care. I want you to turn away from godless chatter and the opposing ideas of what is falsely called knowledge. All that stuff you've been taught about money, you need to just let it go. All that stuff you've been taught, you know, you're going to go to school, you're going to get a job, you need to make six figures, you need to drive this kind of car. In order to be successful, you're going to drive a Mercedes. In order to be successful, you're going to wear this polo. In order to be successful, you got to wear some kind of shoes that's $200 a shoe. Made out of the same stuff, maybe a little bit higher grade stuff than, than, than the fifty dollar shoe, but it ain't that much higher. He says you got to get out of this place where you have this this earthly wisdom, this earthly knowledge, this false what he calls false knowledge, and you need to get into this place where you have the wisdom of God. You got to be rich in wisdom. You gonna have to make some good decisions about your money. He says these people have professed. And in so doing, have departed from the faith. Grace be to all of you. Listen to this. He said this money thing is so big that people get caught up in it. And it pulls them away from the church. People get involved in chasing money and they get to the point, they can't, they can't even give. I mean, they get to the point where they don't want to tithe, where they don't want, you know, they, 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 they don't think twice about spending money, but think three times, four times about giving to the church. You're talking about a way to, uh, to really help with good deeds? Tide, give to the church so we can go out and help somebody. We can go out, you can hold us accountable. We, uh, we'll open the books for you anytime. But don't hold back your good deeds and your tithes because you, 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 you're thinking about this money thing and that's what it is. You're trapped behind this money thing. And for many of us, I'm just going to be honest with you because I've been there. You can't tithe. You made so many bad decisions, you don't have 10% of your... A dime on every dollar means the difference between you getting evicted right now. That's how messed up this wisdom of the world is for you. You've gotten way far away from this. You can't even get... You, you want to help people. People call you, you want to help them. You should be able to help them, but you can't help them because you messed up all your money. You've got the wisdom of the world operating on the inside of you. You're thinking that you're making good decisions, driving the right thing. You're making all kind of rationalizations for every dime you spend. And the reality of it is, if you're not, listen, if you're not, if you're not following these principles for money, for being rich, you're not going to be rich. You're not going to end up rich. You're, not going to, you're never going to get there. You, I don't care what you try. This is the only way for you to tap into the inheritance of God. I want you to imagine yourself right now. What changes if, if you start to make wise decisions about, this sounds crazy, I know. What changes if you start, I'm not talking about wise decisions that somebody that's over uh, managing money, your money, that's selling you something, that's telling you, you know, put the stock in this place. Put, I'm not talking about those kind of wise decisions. There's a place for that. I'm not saying that that's the wrong thing. But what happens? When you start making decisions about your money, your finance, about your life based on the inheritance that you have from Christ and not based on any of this other stuff that we get. How does it change your life when you become a lender instead of a borrower? You don't have to be worried about paying people. Right? You don't have to be worried about whether you're going to have enough to make it through the end of this month. What, how does that change? How does that bring peace into your life? How does that change your marriage? You know what the number one reason why people get divorced? money sometimes it shows up as irreconcilable differences but when you sit down and talk to them it, the difference is money how does it change the place that you work and the things that you do how does it change because now that you're rich your life should change now that you're living rich your life should change there ought to be something different about you people who claim to be rich you claim to be rich when I said if are you rich and you clap your hands and you yell there ought to be something different about you you ought to walk out of here wiser about money you ought to walk out of here different you ought to walk out of here wanting to help somebody wanting to give back to somebody wanting to do something for somebody how does this change you? There's one way to get to what you're trying to get to. 
I know you try every way possible. The side hustle, you may have to do these things for a period of time, but once you apply godly wisdom to your finances, you want to you want to do these six things in order to get paid every month. I, you, you, don't, you don't have to. God did not intend for you to work 70, 80 hours a week in order to make it. That's just time you can't spend with him. Time you can't spend with your family. Time you can't rest. God never intended for you. There's not a person in the Bible that, that had multiple jobs. Everybody was something. A shepherd, a farmer, a, a carpenter, whatever the case may be. You didn't hear about this guy in the Bible that was a carpenter and then on the side hustle he was a shepherd. And then, on, and then he had another side hustle just on weekends and when the game came in town, you know, he, he would... No, he was a cook, you know, he didn't, no, no. Not God intended for you to live. C can you see it? Can you see yourself being rich? Can you see yourself being in control? Can you see passing that legacy down to your son? Because he's going to start right now, Zach. He's starting with zero. He doesn't, he's, he's not, he doesn't know anything. He has not been trained anyway. And he's going to believe what he sees in you, Zach. And he's going to believe what you tell him and what you teach him and what you show him. And you have an opportunity, just like the rest of us in this room, parents, we have an opportunity to leave a legacy with our children. That's what an inheritance is. It's a legacy. You can leave a legacy with your children. You can change them from this world. You can focus them on good, doing good deeds. You can focus them on going out and being wise when it comes to money. You can focus them on not focusing on this mammon, this, this, this evil thing that's pulling them away from everything and focusing on, those, on this thing that God wants us to focus on. But here's the question I have for you. Will you claim it? Are you going to turn this in? Are you going to sign it and claim it? Are you going to change the things that need to be changed? You, you've got vision. Now, God's given us vision on this thing of money. He's shown us every... Nobody should walk out of here not understanding what God feels about money and about being rich. Or anything. I've, I've taken my time in study and in delivery. Taking my time to walk this through for you. You know, you're not, you're not ignorant anymore. You might have been ignorant. You might have been raised in a world system. Mammon may have had control of you, but you know now. This is the real name and the claim. You're going to change your life and you're going to be transformed by what you've learned today. So this week, very simple thing. That's all you need to know. Because my God supplies all my needs, I will be rich in what? Good deeds. Because God takes care of me, because he supplies everything, because God, when I look back over my life, it wasn't anybody but the Spirit of God taking care of me. And because he has taken care of me, the way that I'm going to show that I'm rich is by going out and taking care of as many people as I possibly can. Whose declaration is that going to be today? Amen. That's rich people right there. To God be the glory. Amen. Amen.